Yeah. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started this morning. Mic check, mic check, one, two, three. Guess you have to talk directly into it. Mic check, mic check, one, two. Mic check, mic check, one, two, three. Is this good? How's that sound? That's good? Mic check. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, okay. Good morning, church. How's everybody doing? Man, uh... <laughs> Let me say, let's start over. Good morning, everyone. How's everybody doing? Good All right. That's okay. That was much better. Go ahead and set up, son. But I got to make sure my family's doing it, right? Yeah, so yeah. Got to support me, man. <laughs> I said I wasn't going to talk about it, but I, no, hold on, hold on, come on, man, I know it's early, I know it's early, man, come on, y'all, I know y'all can sing, y'all can sing louder than that, come on now, well, not necessarily louder, but just with more enthusiasm, <laughs> we're singing praises to God this morning, guys, and I'm grateful to be here to be able to share this moment with you guys, I'm hoping that you feel the same way, man, yeah. all right, here we go, I said I wasn't going to talk about it, but I, no, I, no, I, I said I wasn't going to talk about it, but I couldn't keep it to myself, what the Lord for me, you ought to have been there when he saved my soul, you ought to have been there when he wrote my name on the road. I started walking, I started talking, I started singing, I started shouting what the Lord has done for me. Said I wasn't going to sing about it, but I couldn't keep it to myself. No, I, no, I, I said I wasn't going to sing about it, but I couldn't keep it to myself. What the Lord has done for me, you ought to have been there when he saved my soul. You ought to have been there when he wrote my name on the road. I started walking, I started talking, I started singing, I started shouting what the Lord has done for me. Said I wasn't going to preach about it, but I, no, I, no, I, I said I wasn't going to preach about it, but I couldn't keep it to myself, what the Lord has done for me, you ought to have been there, when he saved my soul, you ought to have been there, when he wrote my name on the road, I started walking, I started talking, I started singing, I started shouting what the Lord has done for me. I said I wasn't going to talk about it, but I, no, I, no, I, I said I wasn't going to talk about it, but I, couldn't keep it to myself, what the Lord has done for me. You ought to have been there when he saved my soul. You ought to have been there when he wrote my name on the road. I started walking, I started talking, I started singing, I started shining what the Lord has done for me. I said, I started walking, I started talking, I started singing, I started shouting what the Lord has done for me. Hey, Amen. That was a good way to wake up, wasn't it? <laughs> now, we don't have the screen, but I think most of you guys know, I know that my Redeemer lives. It's a fun song. It's a great song to sing to. All right, here we go. I know that my Redeemer lives and ever prays for me. 
I know eternal life he gives from sin and sorrows free. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know, I know eternal life he gives. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. He wills that I should wholly be in word and thought and deed. Then I his holy place may see when from this earth life free. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know, I know eternal life he gives. I know. I know that my Redeemer lives. I know that unto sinful men his saving grace is nigh. I know that he will come again and take me home on high. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know, I know, eternal life he gives. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know that over yonder stands a place prepared for me. A home, a house not made with hands most wonderful to see. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know, I know eternal life he gives. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. Amen. You may be seated. Amen, amen, amen. If you're going to heaven, can I get an amen? amen? No, 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 no. If you're going to heaven, can I get an amen? amen? If Jesus has forgiven you from your sins, can I get an amen? amen. We are here to worship our God. In Hebrews 2, it says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down in the right hand of the throne of God. Other, other scriptures say author and perfecter of our faith. That means he is the beginning and the end. He starts on your journey and he finishes it. My life, our life has been a whirlwind these past three weeks. Y'all know uh, Sam got in a car, a car accident. Pray for the other person because it was Sam's fault. He at least remembers that much of it. Um, your car was going about 45 miles an hour. He was on a dirt bike, pulled out of his apartment, got hit, thrown off the bike. Um, no broken bones. No major head injuries. Some road rash, and he's limping around on some. My mom's cane, like a 75-year-old man. But he's home. He was supposed to be deployed on the 26th of March. That's no longer happening. And he's wondering why. And I told him, Sam, I can't tell you why. I don't even understand the story that's being written. But I know who's writing it. I know who's finishing it. God tells me. Jesus is the author and perfecter of our faith. I didn't get the job that I spoke to you guys about. Amen. Then it wasn't for me. That I know Jesus is the author and perfecter of my faith. So I don't understand the story. Maybe my wife just can't stand me being at home more than a few hours a day. I don't know. Maybe he's doing it to protect her faith. It is what, hey, well, see, look, I knocked the mic out. Anyway, but anyway, back. Look at that. Um, but I know that God's going to finish it, and I can stand firm in that. Now, I want to give you guys a few updates of the church renovation. I would say we left the floor unfinished as a symbol of God working on us, and he's not done yet, but that ain't it. We ran out of time, just to be honest with you. 
we didn't want to damage it, so when we're done, we're going to move the chairs out. We'll be finished this week. Um, scheduling is an industrial strength, so getting it in here took a little longer than we had expected, but uh, we made the decision. Uh, I want to give a shout out to Andre. He was here for 33 hours straight. <laughs> and, uh, and his son, Drew, probably about 22. He tapped out a little bit. He ain't as strong as he thought he was. You know, grown man strength is a little bit different. But uh, definitely grateful for the work that they, they've been putting in. Um, and, and we made some decisions together to do the front foyer. He did that at no cost. We worked it into the bid because my company is the one doing the renovation. So we just worked that into the cost to help. So we, we want to praise God in everything we do. Um, the bathroom is completely fixed. There was a five foot deep by four foot hole. When my son was in there, you could only see him from neck up. Um, I got pictures of it because it was, I was like, wow, my bad, bro. I didn't know you had to dig it that deep. But uh, it, it's fixed, running, retiled, and he did, he did an amazing job. You can't even tell he ever tore it up. Definitely grateful for that. The doors are probably 97% done. Got some trim work. Um, and those will be finished this week. So we come back next week, God willing. Just like God finishes our faith, we'll be finishing with the renovations. But uh, let's just go to God in prayer. God, we come to you today grateful. Grateful that we get to call you God. You call us sons and daughters. And we're so grateful for that. We're grateful that we're able to come to a church as me and Andre were talking yesterday. We can just be who we are. The good, the bad, the ugly, because you loved us at our ugliest. You stepped in when I was at my worst and said, I got you. So how can I not believe that you're working it out for me? How can I not believe that at the end of the day, if I believe you're in heaven, I'm going to be there with you? So all the other things don't matter when we look in perspective of, of what you've done for us. I'm grateful to be here at the Memphis Church. I pray that everyone that is here can just be encouraged today, regardless of what we've gone through this week, because it is ups and downs. There are no promises of a good life with you. You actually say the road's going to be hard and windy and all those things, but the destination is what matters. God, I thank you for everyone that's here. I pray that we can grow closer together. As we grow closer together, we grow closer to you, and that we can just take this out and uh, take our message out to the world because our message is for everybody. Your love is for everybody because your perfect love never fails. Pray for our service. Be with Andre today as he's bringing our message. Be with Steve as he's out there delivering the message. I'm going to forget where he's at. I think Jacksonville. Wherever he's at, be with him. Uh, let let um, him be an encouragement to them like he is with us every week. And pray that uh, you're with his family as he's traveling and gone and he gets home safely. We love you. We pray everything. We dedicate this service to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now we're going to sing a song, Unto the O Lord to uh, help prepare our hearts for communion. Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. O my God, I trust in thee, so let me not be ashamed. Let not my enemies triumph over me. Let none that wait on thee be ashamed. Let none that wait. On thee be ashamed, O oh my God, I trust in thee, so let me not be ashamed, let not my enemies triumph over me, remember not. The sins of my youth, remember not. The sins of my youth, 
Oh my God, I trust in thee. So let me not be ashamed, let not my enemies triumph over me. Teach me thy paths, thy ways, O oh Lord. Teach me thy paths, thy ways, O oh Lord. My God, I trust in thee. So let me not be ashamed, let not my enemies triumph for me. Good morning, family. You know, uh, it was amazing the energy that, you know, not only from Andre, as always, but Robert provided as we were talking about the changes, the upgrades, the, the uh, church as a self. You know, it's energy that drives. It's the way that we worship God that brings us in here. And it doesn't matter, as Andre said, how your week started or how your morning started, whether you woke up. I fully intended to come here be in my uniform because I'm going to be uh, speaking at Roland Noble's event uh, this afternoon. So I was going to explain. I'm going, yeah, I'm all dressed up, you know, retired Navy guy, and I still love it. And God said no, because I couldn't find my ribbon to go. So I'm running through the house, pulling everything up, you know, trying to find that thing. Sharon says, stop and pray. We stopped, we prayed. I still didn't find it. But as I was walking out the door, I went back in. I said, honey, I know where it is. I left it in a shoebox. And sure enough, it was in that shoebox. But as things go on and we start our day, and we come in here, whatever God gives us to give, and I say give because we come to give when we come here. Today is my time to share my the, uh, communion. And it's going to be something that I'm going to give uh, in hopes that it cut, touches some, some part of your heart to give you the, the gratitude for what Jesus and God gave us in the cross. And I'll, I'll talk about, because what I'm going to talk about for the, there's about four different seniors who are graduating from the Sea Cadet uh, this evening, this afternoon. And uh, I'm going to speak on legacy. And it's going to be a great opportunity for them to see what they have left in store for them for their lives. Because we don't think about legacy. Have you ever thought about the legacy that God leaves, that Jesus left? We do it every Sunday. We remember that legacy. We remember what he did in order to change this world, what he gave each and every one of us, what he provided a path for us to do. That was the legacy that our Jesus left for us. For those who don't know me, my name is Vic Cooper. I'm honored to be up here. I'm honored to share. And, uh, you know, we do communion every Sunday in this church. We, we go through communion. It's a time of fellowship. It's a time where we connect with God. It's a time where we remember all that he's done for us, and it gives us a chance to seek the forgiveness and go to the foot of the cross so that we may continue to have that path to salvation that God provided. So, you know, we do it every Sunday, not because we couldn't do it Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, because in life, there's numerous times when there's a need for us to go to the foot of the cross. The sin that drove us to the cross is continuous in our life each and every day. So whenever you need to, but specifically today, when we're, when we're talking about Jesus and we're talking about what he did and we, we're remembering, we're meditating, you know, take that time to give thanks for that. So in this moment, have you ever, this is the question I have for you. How many of you have been so broken that you turn to the cross? That should be all of us. You know, really, truly, it should be. Because we wouldn't be here if, if we hadn't turned to the cross. And there's always something in our life that drove us to the cross. 
And so the fact that we were broken means that we must imagine that God had to provide a response to us. And that response was his son, Jesus. So as you guys are turning to Isaiah 53, you know, think about this. We're going to start in verse 1. When we talk about brokenness, broken people, a broken situation, we usually have an entirely negative conception of that in our minds. It's bad to be broken. It's bad to be broken. That's not what God says. God wants you broken so that you can come to him. So we, as we continue, please, we're going to read through Isaiah 51. I'm sorry, Isaiah 53, starting in verse 1. And the scriptures read, Who has believed our message, and to whom has armed, who has the arm of the Lord has been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one, of the, like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we consider him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, our sins, our iniquities. He was crushed for all our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was him. And he, by his wounds, we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. We, we tend to all have, uh, you know, some brokenness there. Have gone astray. Each of us turned to our own ways. And the Lord has held him, held, has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shears is silent. So he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he has taken away. He was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. And the transgressions of my people, he was punished. He has assigned a grave, he was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him, curse him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteousness, righteous servant will justify many and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will see him, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. That's what our Jesus did. And God lays it out. He lays it out. And when he tells you that being broken is a, the way that he wants you, and that's pretty much true in God's eyes because it's not a bad thing. It's becoming broken, which, again, drives us to him. When things get hard, this morning, I had a brother come in last night. We were at the movies, several brothers in here. We, were, we went to dinner. We went to the movies, and... We went to see Dune, the great movies. He hadn't seen it. Recommend it. Uh, and he came in late. And uh, known him since, oh, I say 2007, he and his wife. And uh, we were happy. 
happy that he came in. I'm thinking, great, this brother Ian, I hadn't seen him in a while. I'm gonna catch up after I get back from the movies and dropping off Roberto. And, and the brother came in with life. Life that kept us talking to like 12.30 in the morning. Life that woke us up at six this morning to continue that conversation. Sins in life is what Jesus died for us for. He went to the cross so that we can have that path that no matter what we allow our sinful nature to do, the path is there. So when you're broken, that's exactly where you need to be. And I pray today, you know, because we're always in a sinful state, I pray that today you're able to meditate and go to God in your brokenness to ask for the redemption that comes from him. Let us go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you that no matter what we do, God, how we do it, how our day's been, that you're there for us. God, we thank you that, that you're there, that we can lay, lay the burdens on you. God, that when we're so broken and things so hard that we don't know a way, you know a way. And God, we thank you for that way. God, we pray that as uh, we take of the bread, remember your son's body. As we take of the wine, remember his blood. God, that covers us, that we may have that relationship with you, Father. We pray humbly and earnestly for your forgiveness. We thank you for the promise of salvation. We thank you for loving us when we didn't love ourselves. Father, we just thank you for all you who you are. Father, we love you. Take this moment, and we give you all the grace and the glory. In your son Jesus, we pray. Amen.
I get everybody to stand. Hail, hail, line of Judah. How wonderful you are. <laughs> hail, hail, line of Judah. How wonderful you are. Lion of Judah, I love thee. Because you died upon that tree. They led you off to Calvary. And you went there just for me. Hail, hail, Lion of Judah, how powerful you are. Hail, hail, Lion of Judah, how powerful you are. In my sin, my life was dead. I did not often use my head. I found that Bible and I read. Then I did just what it said. Hail, hail, Lion of Judah, how marvelous you are. Hail, hail, Lion of Judah, how marvelous you are. Lion of Judah, now I know to that cross you had to go. For me, you took every blow. Now it's for you that I go. Hail, hail, Lion of Judah, <laughs> how glorious you are. Hail, hail, Lion of Judah, how glorious you are. One of these days, and it won't be long. Lion of Judah's gonna take me home. And now I know I'm not alone. All these friends I could call my own. Sing hell. Hail, Lion of Judah. Come on. <laughs> Sing hail, hail, Lion of Judah. Sing hail, hail, Lion of Judah. All right. Sing hail, hail, Lion of Judah. How glorious you are. 
How marvelous you are. How powerful you are. How wonderful you are. Sing him, him, Lion of Judah. Come on. <laughs> Hail, Lion of Judah. Hail, hail, Lion of Judah. Hail, Lion of Judah. How glorious you are. How marvelous you are. How powerful you are. How wonderful you are. How wonderful you are. You are. Amen. <laughs> I love you guys. You may be seated. That's a fun song, man. It's always a workout. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Let's see if I can find uh, my message. Where is it? There it is. All right. There we go. The title of the message is Salt of the Earth. I thought that uh, what Vic said during the communion, I thought was was awesome, and the reason why I say that is because for those of us who have committed our lives to Christ, whether it was a year ago, or whether it was 10 years ago, or whether it was 20 years ago, or 30 or 40, however far back you could possibly go, the fact will always remain that every single day we have growth to do. We have growing to do. We have change to make. It's always going to be hard. And, and just like the scripture says that you have to, you know, to follow Christ, you have to carry your cross daily, right? And, and when Vic was talking about during the communion about being broken, what does that look like? And when you think about what Steve has been talking about for the last several months, we're talking about the Beatitudes, right? That's in Matthew chapter 5. And when you look at that, you see a state of brokenness before God. And I believe that being in that state will constantly and consistently move you towards God. That's why I think that what Vic said was extremely, extremely important uh, when it comes to remembering who Christ is and what Christ means to each of us every single day. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Andre Bailey, and I'm excited to be here this morning to talk to you guys uh, about the words of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Over the last several months, as I said before, Steve has been talking about the Beatitudes, and I think that he's done an amazing job, like, breaking that down. You know, it's cool when you can sit and listen to someone and hear something new that will cause you to just pause and think about what's being said. Because I, I love having conversations, and I, people that know me know I love to talk. Uh, but I love having conversations with different people because I think that every personality that I see is a personality that in and of itself came from God. And it's like when I look out in this room, I, I feel that I'm looking at the whole of who God is. Each of you guys are different. And, and if he knew each of us before we were born and he gave each of us the breath of life, then each one of you guys are different perspectives and aspects of who God is. And so I always look forward to having a conversation with each one of you guys because there's always something new to learn when you hear someone else's perspective. We all may live in the same span of life. We may all live even in the same area, but we all do have different experiences. And I think for a reason, so that we can, as we come together as a fellowship and as a whole, learn from each other's experiences and grow to be wholly who we are in the body of Christ. In Matthew 5, uh, Steve broke down a lot of things um, that you can both look at and think about in relation to what it is to be like Christ. 
I think that God has moved Steve's heart to talk about these things for us to come to a better understanding of what we are to be in this world existing in the body of Christ. I think that we can often take for granted that our true purpose in this world as followers of Christ. Remember, he is the Messiah that was sent to show us the way. The question is, will we follow? I want to take a look at Matthew chapter 5. Where's my phone? Matthew chapter 5, uh, verse 3. I want to read them before I go any further, because uh, everything that's going to be said is going to tie into that. This is Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. It says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. That's, an, that's just an amazing passage, and it sums up a whole, whole lot. Now, what I want to do is I want to go just a step further. And in the same space, I want us to read verse 13. It says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You know, Steve also talked about this verse several weeks ago, if I'm not mistaken. It explained to us some of the purposes that, uh, some of the purposes and importance that salt had in those days. It was used to flavor food. We all know that. Uh, It was also used as a preservative for meats, and it was a commodity to be traded. I want to take, well, I want to take the moment to talk about another purpose for salt that was talked about in Luke. I never realized how important salt was in those days, and I never really looked into it uh, because I've heard so much information today about avoiding salt, especially when it comes to, uh, to high blood pressure. I mean, seriously, you know, we hear these things like, you know, don't, don't eat too much salt this, don't eat too much salt that. But, I mean, honestly, when you look back in, in those times, they were surrounded by it because it was used for a lot of different purposes. So I want to look at Luke chapter 14, verse 34. Now, I'm going to be reading the... The NIV version. And this is what it says. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown out. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. There's a reason why he said that. And I have to admit, I paused when I saw that, because you know how sometimes you stop and you look at things, and you could have read something a thousand times, but for some reason, at a certain point of your spiritual growth, there's a pause that hits you when you, when you hear certain things. Well, this was one of those moments where it caused me to pause, and I wanted to, to dive Uh, into why he would say this in this particular context. Because the way that it's stated in Matthew is not the same way that it's stated in Luke. Luke actually takes it a step further than it does in Matthew. 
So if you look at what is said in both Matthew and Luke, it should move you to pause for a second to kind of ask, okay, why is there a difference, right? I mean, it says somewhat of the same thing, but there is a slight difference. I was listening to a sermon because when I, when I work, uh, you know, walls don't talk back. And I'd probably look crazy if I was just sitting there talking to walls all day. Uh, but I, I'll sit there and I'll listen to different lectures. I'll listen to different sermons because, I, again, I want to hear what, what people have to say. And sometimes someone will say something that will cause you to just pause and do research because you want to know. There was a, a pastor, and I think he was speaking to his church. I have no idea who this guy was. But he started to say some things that was, that was pretty profound from the perspective of what salt really, you know, some more reasons as to what salt was used for in those days. He said that if you are salt of the earth, not by saying or doing something, but rather by being something. You see the difference? To be salt of the earth, it doesn't matter what you say or what you do, it's, it's who you are. It's, it's, how, it's how you move through this planet. No matter where you go, no matter where you are, whether you're by yourself or whether you're amongst a million people, you are still the salt of the earth if you are in the body of Christ. Why is that important? Salt affects its environment sif- simply by being what it is. We are going to be salt, and that means that we are going to be totally different from our environment. Now, as I dive into why he says these things, it'll start to to make sense because I'm like, what? (laughs) And so Luke's gospel defines what the salt of the earth means. Even though Matthew states it, Luke defines it. And so we have to look at all this in context and what it means to the people that Christ is talking to when it comes to the Jewish people. Salt has more uses in flavor uh, for food or used as a preservative. I found that salt in the ancient world was scraped up from the shores, depending on the area, especially the area that they were in, were scraped up from the shores of the Dead Sea. And there were several different kinds of salts that came out of the Dead Sea. It's not a pure sodium, it's not a pure mixture of sodium chloride, but rather a mixture of various salts. One particular salt that was used in those days was, was a, a mixture of salt called potash, pot ash. And uh, if you are familiar with agriculture or gardening, you know that potash is used to, to fertilize the ground. And it has uh, different additives, well, I guess a, a different mixtures of different types of things that would help the growth of plants and crops. And so it has nitrogen, it has phosphorus, and it has potassium. Now, plants need phosphate to develop the roots, nitrates to develop the leaves, and potash to develop the flowers and the fruit. Now, this is salt. Balanced fertilizer will have all three in order to yield a great result. Now, as I'm saying these things, imagine what that looks like spiritually. Think about this. We're talking about Christ, and he's talking about spiritual things using examples that they understood in everyday life. When it comes to the word of God, and I truly believe this because it speaks about it in the book of Isaiah, where where it says that when God was speaking to the Israelites, he said, come, let us reason together. You cannot have reason without logic. In other words, whatever God is saying to you is going to make sense if you are willing to hear what's being said. This is one of those moments where the people that Christ is talking to understood what he meant and what he said about being the salt of the earth. Now, the Dead Sea also had a lot of sodium chloride as well, which was used to flavor food, which is table salt. However, the content given in Luke points to the usage of salt as a fertilizer. However, it also speaks of another usage of salt as well, the dung hill. And in this context, it wasn't talking about 
the manure that comes from animals, it was actually talking about the manure that comes from human beings. In those days, uh, they would dig a hole in their backyards, and, and they would, you know, relieve their bowels, and they would actually take the salt and sprinkle it on top of it. Now, what was the salt doing when it comes to that particular purpose? It was a disinfectant. <laughs> Is that not crazy? It was a disinfectant. It would keep bacteria from growing, and it would keep it from spreading. Now, imagine if they didn't do that. Now, this is, this is a different kind of salt, but this is another purpose of what it was being used for. And when you read it in context in Luke, they understood what he was saying. They, they fully understood exactly what he was saying. And so when they would do this, there would be a box of salt next to what, whatever area they were in, and then, of course, they would sprinkle it. It would be used to stop the spread of something that you did not want to grow. So salt had both a negative and a positive purpose in the ancient days. It would not allow bad things to grow while also being used to promote good things to grow. This gives you a very vivid picture of what Christians ought to be. Can you guys see that? The salt of the earth. Jesus always used visuals every single time to try to get us to understand what is truly being said so that we can walk away different. And we can walk away with a, a clear visual of who we are to be in the body of Christ. He's the living word of God. He knows everything. We don't. All we have to do is just be willing to listen. Now, as I was saying earlier, when you think about the spiritual aspects of what was just being said, what does that mean when it comes to being a disciple of Jesus Christ? I got three different aspects that I want us to consider and ponder on what it is when it comes to being the salt of the earth. One aspect is quantity. How much? See, we're living in a morally decaying world. Definitions of words are being changed. It seems to be pretty much on a daily basis. Up is down, and right is wrong, and bad is good, and the list can go on and on. But this is what it says in Isaiah 5, verses 20, chapter 5, verse 20. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. That's how bad off we are. These are the times that all of us are living in. We are called to be salt of the earth in these times. It's been said that it only takes 5% of the population to promote change in a society. 5%. I believe that to be true considering that we heavily, meaning our society, promotes and defend lifestyles that are contrary to the scripture that's portrayed by 1% of the population. You see that? It only takes a small group. The question is, who's yelling the loudest? And people will always hear those who are yelling the loudest. What's that saying back in the day, uh, a hit dog gonna holler? You throw that rock, the one who gets hit is gonna holler. And so when you start talking about living and existing as, as the salt of the earth, those who are living blatantly in sin are going to scream to the rooftops. They're going to call you all kinds of names. They're going to persecute you in all kinds of ways because they want society from a narcissistic perspective to move in their direction. I had an opportunity with a client of mine. Uh, I didn't know, uh, honestly, that he was gay at all. I mean, that... He wasn't flamboyant in any kind of way. And I was painting, I was doing a faux finish on his, um, on his island. And, and we just started talking because something came on the TV that, that made him pause for a second. And he started talking about what they were talking about on TV concerning, you know, the gay lifestyle as well as uh, how Christians have treated people that were gay. And, and he came up to me and he started the conversation. I wasn't even really looking for it. And he says, I don't understand why Christians behave the way that they do. I was like, what are you talking about? 
He's like, well, you know, I've met people that were Christians, and he's like, you know, they, they condemn me to hellfire and this and that, and, and, and they tell me that I'm wrong in the way that I live. And I was like, really? He's like, and I just don't like it. I was like, I, I don't know. Why, why are you saying, are you? He's like, yeah, I'm gay. You know, I'm married. I have a husband. Oh, didn't know that. You know, I, I mean, I'm just saying my, my life, the majority of my life, people that I've met that were gay can be somewhat flamboyant. Very, very feminine in, in the sense of a lot of the ways of how they interact. Um, and he just wasn't any of that at all. And, and he looked at me, he said, you didn't know? No, how would I know? <laughs> I mean, you're not, you're not behaving in this way. And, and he said, so how do you feel about that? I said, well, listen, I believe in Jesus Christ, and I believe that he rose from the dead, and I believe that he's the son of God. And I know what the scripture says when it comes to this kind of lifestyle. Let me ask you a question. Do you believe in God? No. Well, then we're not on the same page. We're not. I don't expect for you to believe in what I believe in no more than you should expect for me to believe in how you choose to live. Now, regardless of how you choose to live, that's your choice. But if you ask me what my belief is, I'm going to tell you. Now, if my belief does not correspond with how you believe, there's one thing that remains constant. I can treat you with absolute respect. Because even though you have chosen to live your life the way that you have, you are still made in the image of God as a creation. Now, it's your choice on whether you want to move in the direction of right or move in a direction that is in opposition to God. And he looked at me, and he said, I have never talked to anyone that was a Christian that gave me an answer like that. Not only did I finish the job and he gave me the check, he even added a bonus to it. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> Listen, we're going to find ourselves in environments and conversations where we can firmly stand on the scriptures and firmly stand in the word of God and speak the truth and love with respect. Now, people might not like it, but the way that you deliver it and the way that you respond makes all the difference in the world. Christ, look at where he was. Look at how he communicated with people. He was 100% respectful. Even to the Sadducees and Pharisees, even though they absolutely did not like what he had to say. See, in order for salt to promote growth, it has to be used in abundance. Everywhere you go, you have to be that salt. Every place you step in the world is, is you spreading that salt, you spreading the gospel, you spreading the truth. It has to be spread across the whole field in order for it to be effective in growing the flowers and the crops that you want to grow. When Jesus stated what was said in Luke 14, the Jews understood exactly what he meant. I believe that it has always been God's intent for the gospel to grow and spread across the whole world. Matthew chapter 28. 18. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. God wanted, wants the whole world to be impacted. Every nation on this planet, he wants that salt of the earth to be in it. <laughs> My second point is distribution. How it's distributed. In order for salt to have an effect on its surrounding area, it needs to make contact with the soil. You guys see that? Now, if, if we are the salt of the earth, then that means that we got to make contact with the soil. Well, what's the soil? What do you guys think the soil is? Come on, Julia. <laughs> Other human beings, think about it, guys. Regardless of how we've committed our lives to Christ, the fact remains is that we are part of a whole creation. What makes the separation is, is being in the body of Christ and not being in the world. But that whole creation, God loves. He absolutely loves. But whether a person chooses to love God back is completely up to the individual. <laughs> The salt was used to nourish the soil and to help promote an environment 
of growth for plants or crops being placed in it. Salt would also have the same effect on the manure pile by preventing disease or bacteria from growing. Can you guys see the, the spiritual ramifications of that? Yes. Come on, man. <laughs> yes. Where was Christ? He wasn't always in the temple. As a matter of fact, he spent more time in, in the world, like reaching those that were lost, reaching those that would hear what he has to say, reaching those who wanted to hear what he had to say. He wasn't in the temple the majority of the time. Think about that. This man is talking to a Samaritan woman at the well. In those times, Jews didn't associate themselves with Samaritans. You know what's ironic about that? And Samaritans were considered half Jews. Yes, they were interracial. Yes, over, over a period of time, they, they, the Jewish, those that were full-blooded Jews, decided to disassociate themselves from these people who were half Jews. Yes, they wouldn't even communicate with them. Crazy, right? That's human nature for you. Yes. And what did Jesus do? He's talking to the Samaritan woman like she was anyone else. Why? Because he created her along with everyone else. So how should we move as followers and disciples of Christ? As the same. How else are we going to make an impact? Think about that. It's, look, I, I love and enjoy being around you guys. But we, we are fighting to be like-minded, right? But if I spend all my time around you guys, what about those that are out there that are lost? And how fair is that? No, it's not. It's not. There was a gentleman, the one that I was listening to, he was saying that he had the opportunity to talk to a lady who walked up to him, and, and she said, you know, I'm just really excited, you know, because the, the, uh, the law firm that I'm working with now, you know, no one there believes in God, and it's just very hard to just even listen to what they're saying, and I have the opportunity to work for this Christian law firm where I'm around everyone but Christians. And he said, and she was very, very excited about it. And he looked at her and said, why are you excited about being around only Christians? a very odd question to ask, right? You, I mean, because think about it. You were thinking the Christian world. It was like, oh, go ahead. Be around as many Christians as possible. But this is what he said. You are choosing to leave a firm where no one believes in God, to go to a firm where everyone believes in God. And now you're stripping away the choice. I mean, not the choice. You're stripping away the opportunity for those who don't know God to know who God is in you. And I was like, What? And, he, and then he went on to say, this is the reason why the scripture says that, that you know, in the job or in, the, in, in, in the, uh, the occupation that you were called, when God called you, remain in that. Why? Because there's people in that occupation that need to be reached. The same way there are people in music that needs to be reached, in sports that need to be reached. I mean, the scripture says, some of you guys have heard this, that I will place you before kings and queens. How are you going to do that? But the only people you're hanging out with are those who believe in God. It can't happen. How is that being the salt of the earth? You got to be willing to go out into the world, not be like the world, but to go out into the world to preach the gospel so that you can reach those who are willing to hear what the gospel is saying. But if you don't do that, this is what you're doing, is you're holding on to it for yourself. Now, how selfish is that? It doesn't, you would think that in the Christian world, it wouldn't sound selfish, right? But it is. Is that what Christ did? No. No. He shared with everyone who was willing to listen. Even those that were demon-possessed was running out to Christ. He wasn't even trying to talk to them. This man is walking along the way, and this guy comes out the cave. Hey, Christ, <laughs> have you come to send us into the abyss? What? That's how powerful Christ is. But that's also how powerful we are in Christ. Think about that. The Holy Spirit is inside of each and every one of us who have made the commitment to exist in the body of Christ. Remember, when you came to Christ and when you were baptized into Christ, you became a new creation. 
but do you live like it? <laughs> because when you look at the Christian world today, it's very, very questionable. Christ himself was found to be surrounded by unbelievers who wanted to hear his message. We would be the same, and we should be the same. He remained connected to God and his disciples, but feverishly interacted with those that were lost as if it were done on purpose. You see that? Luke 19, verses 1 through 9. Luke 19, verses 1 through 9. You don't have to turn there. I'll just read it, but you can write it down. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he is going to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, now listen to this. Today, salvation has come to this house because this man, too, is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and save the lost. I just got chills on that. <laughs> he came to seek and save the lost. My last point is quality. That's my last point, quality. Matthew 5, 13 says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt lose, loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. When seeing this, I asked myself, how could salt no longer be salty? It's a crazy question to ask, right? Because <laughs> I've never known salt to lose is saltiness. But by looking into what it meant historically, I discovered what Jesus meant, and I also realized how the Jews understood what was being said. While removing potash, 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 I hope I'm saying that right, potash, potash, thank you, I love you, man, potash, potash. <laughs> And because uh, uh, you didn't hear this, but it's, it's, a, it's a type of salt that's used as a fertilizer. But it's also used as a disinfectant also. Yeah. Crazy, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so while removing pot, uh, potash from the Dead Sea, uh, potash, okay, potash, uh, from the Dead Sea, some would dig up more sand than salt. And by doing so, uh, it would not have the same potency or effect in usage. You see that? Ah, because you got more sand than salt. So in realizing this, they would simply discard it and walk over it and continue about their day. Isn't that wild? It's pretty amazing, huh? No one would sprinkle their food with sand, right? <laughs> What benefit would that bring? <laughs> we would all throw it out. I know we would because we're used to salt. We know what salt tastes like. Well, look at this from a spiritual perspective. If you're mixed with ideologies and worldly thinking in your spiritual walk, then you've been tainted. We need to really stop. And we need to ponder on that, and we need to meditate on that, and we need to truly, truly consider where we are in the body of Christ in this world. We are living, and all of us know this, in an age of mankind. 
not just simply the civilization that we live in, but in the whole age of mankind where information is abundant, and I mean extremely abundant. Because you got to remember, prior to the writing of the Bible itself, or prior to the printing of the Bible, literacy wasn't very high. It, it really did come about, you know, especially during the, the printing of the, of the Bible itself, literacy started to become more and more pronounced in, in developing societies. And so now we have this whole abundance of information and uh, information and ideas and, and ideologies that may sound great, you know, and they sound like the truth, but we know what the scripture says. We've heard it. And so people are going to go looking for what their itching ears want to hear. It goes back to what I was saying earlier. The reason why the 1%, and I'm not just talking about the 1% in relation to someone who is homosexual. I'm talking about uh, the, the, the other aspects of what sin is. Because for some reason, you know, you, you talk to some people within the Christian world that will look at that as being like the most heinous. But it's not. <laughs> I was talking to a pastor who had a Ph.D. in biblical studies. He was a client of mine. And, and he's talking to me about, about the punishments of hell. And he was like, well, I believe that there's different levels of punishment. I was like, well, that doesn't make sense. And he was like, well, yeah, but that's just what I believe. That's what I learned out of uh, theology, the school of theology that he went to. And I was like, well, you got to make that make sense to me. And he's like, well, how, why don't you understand what that means? I was like, well, why would there be different punishments for different sins when they all come from the same place? He's like, what do you mean? I was like, well, if I steal from you, why am I stealing from you? Because I want to. If I lie to you, why do I lie to you? Because I want to. If I, if I kill you and murder you, why do I do it? Because I want to. It's for my own selfish purpose. Sin comes from selfishness and disobedience, period. And so the penalty for all of that is just death. It doesn't matter how minute or how grandiose you might think it is, but it's still coming from the same place of selfishness and disobedience. The Christian world today has been tainted because they want to be accepted by the world instead of separating themselves. That's why we find ourselves where we are. That's why we're not making as big of an impact as we should. How can you save a world when you're living just like you? You are no longer useful when you have lost your saltiness due to contamination. That's why I I believe scripture when it says this, Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I would tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. See, I don't want to find myself in that position. And that's why I think the scripture tells us every single day that we are to examine ourselves, that we are to carry our crosses daily. And if we're not doing that, then we have to stop and we have to really question if we are truly being a disciple of Jesus Christ. Being the salt of the earth will bring persecution and accusation. The world lives in opposition to the Beatitudes listed in Matthew 5. But we are to embrace them, live them, become them, and in doing so, becoming more and more like Christ. Be the salt of the earth. To God be the glory. Morning, church. Andre, that was an awesome message, brother. It really made me think about some stuff as I was driving down the road today. Uh, I am speaking on behalf of Darlene, who is under the weather. I'm speaking for the Hope Contribution. I read this this morning. Uh, It says, did you know that March 22nd is World Water Day? World 
water day. Okay? It is cool because what we have as water, the world doesn't have. A lot of people don't have. Even in this city, the water that we have, you go to Texas, it's totally different, believe me. So World Water Day is a, is a United Nations Observance Day that raises awareness about the global water crisis. According to the World Health Organization, one in four people, like that row right there, only one in four around the world don't have access to safe drinking water. So Hope Worldwide is getting involved to make a difference. So when we give to Hope Worldwide, our money goes to things like that. So people can have clean water. Things that we take for granted every day, unless MLG and W messes up. <laughs> but they never do. Never. So, so we're going to pray for our contribution to, to uh, Hope Worldwide. But remember that when we give, it helps here in Memphis for the local chapter, and it also helps worldwide. Something as simple as that we take for granted as turning the tap on and getting good water. So let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your awesome message. God, I pray that as we leave that our hearts have been pricked to the point where we look at ourselves differently. And God, as we have the opportunity to give to Hope, hope Worldwide, God, I pray that we give unbegrudgingly, but give so that knowing that we are making a difference, not only here locally, but all over the world. God, we thank you for uh, giving us the opportunity to give. Um, and Father, we, we thank you for your grace and your mercy that you extend to us each and every day. We love you. We thank you for all that you do. We pray these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Andre. Very powerful message. Good morning, everyone. I'll continue the trend of announcing who I am. I'm Tom Wong. My privilege to be the Executive Vice President of Communication for the awesome Memphis Church. So uh, go in your Bible first to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Keep your finger there, okay? 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Got some announcements for you. I'll reiterate in email form and other forms of written communication because there's going to be things that uh, you'll need to click on. So the first announcement is that our amazing Memphis Church food pantry and clothing closet will reopen this Thursday at 2 p.m. And so our normal schedule is Sundays at 12.15 p.m. to 2 p.m. and Thursday at 2 p.m. to 5. But due to the renovation, we will not be open today. Back in service this Thursday. Also, mark your calendar for two Saturdays from now. March 16th for the next Mid-South Food Bank Mobile Pantry service opportunity at Binghampton Community Church, 3006 Johnson Avenue, Memphis, 38112. And it will be 8 a.m. for volunteers to help with the distribution of the food and 10 a.m. when the cars start rolling by for the food to be put into their vehicle. Two Saturdays from now, March 16th. Got any singles in our building here, out there in YouTube land? Got a couple announcements related to singles. Our sister church in Louisville, Kentucky, hosting once again in conjunction with the city of Louisville. Thunder over Louisville. 
and it's entitled Better. That's the singles and young professionals in the Louisville church. The theme is Better, a Thunder Over Louisville event. Friday, April 19th to Sunday, April 20th. The registration cost is $30. Contact Michelle, that's M-I-C-H-E-L-E -E underscore Abby, A-B-E-E, -E, at gmail.com for questions. The other singles announcement is the 2024 North American Singles Conference entitled Equipped, Following the Spirit, Anaheim, California. Mickey's hometown, Disneyland. Anaheim, California, August 29th to September 1st. Go to the website N, like Nancy, A, S, C, O, N, like Nancy, 24.com. So, masscon24.com for more information. Over 2,000 disciples are expected to attend for a time of worship, fellowship, and discovery focused on the Holy Spirit, equipping and sending us to participate in the mission of God. Early bird reg registration is $95.00 for those in the U.S. until May 1st. And registration cost is $40 outside of USA. So Canadian, Mexican, uh, $40 for the uh, early registration cost until May. And so those are your announcements. Back to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, Verse 10, so verse 10, we're going to transition now to the taking of our offering. So we've been talking a lot about gratitude. And so before I read this number of verses, I did want to read from a great website, welovegratitude.com, which has periodic postings of folks for things they're grateful for. So I will not do what Steve Jedediah Wormer does by pointing or calling out to people and asking what you're grateful for this time, but I will give examples of what post people have posted for what they're grateful for. Getting to know a friend's foster dog while he was with her. Watering all the plants before the wilting warning. Vitamin D however you can get it, in the shadow of the Great Lakes. True? Or if you're in Britain, vitamin D. <laughs> Finding studies that guide decisions. Like-minded friends to chat with during long events. The right joke at the right time. <laughs> Even daddy jokes. <laughs> Droners. Right, guys? I see, I see Mike shaking his head back. Drawing together, walking in the woods, expected visit from a friend and her daughter. And I particularly like this one. I'm here. Give me a second. I can enjoy a wonderful church service. That's a blessing. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 9, verse 10. Now the one who provides seed for the sower and the bread for food will also provide and multiply your seed and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way for all generosity, which produces thanksgiving to God through us. For the ministry of service, is not only supplying the needs, but also overflowing in many because provided by this ministry, they will glorify God for your obedient confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity 
and share it with them and with everyone. And as they pray on your behalf, they will have affection for you because of the surpassing grace of God in you. Thanks, Jesus, for his indescribable gift. Brothers and sisters, family and friends, what a gift to see some of my family and friends there with from distant places. Well, near. Thank you for your gospel that is done out of obedience. You find God multiplies your gift. Okay, on you. We do thank you for your indescribable gift. I mentioned words there. Effable. Indescribable. Our Father God. Love. Perfect truth. Perfect grace. Thank you for gift giving. Excuse me. Forgive Bless the hands that give it. Multiply it to your glory. Father, we do pray also for the needs that we have in this fellowship, this awesome fellowship. Father, we pray for Miss Johnny's son, John, John Winters, and that you'll help him, the doctors, the medical professionals, to determine what is ailing him and heal him. Please be with his wife, Joyce, and the whole family. We've been through so, so much. Father, please continue to be with Dennis and Mary Lee and their health challenges as well. Thank you for them. I'm so grateful. Father, we pray for Jeanette Long to continue to recuperate and be healthy and strong. Father God, we pray for many other needs in our fellowship that it has been spoken and unspoken. We lay it at your feet, these needs. We know that you provide. We love you. We praise you. We honor you. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, I hope that you guys uh, did receive a word today, whether it was something that was either spoken or even a, a verse in the song. Um, I, I truly believe that that one of our, each one of our goals should be when we come together to fellowship, that we just walk away different. You know what I mean? Better, you know, moving again towards living and existing in the likeness of Jesus Christ. I love you guys. Uh, with that being said, take the Lord with you. <laughs> you got to take the Lord with you, children, everywhere you go. You got to take the Lord with you, children, everywhere you go. You got to take the Lord with you, children, everywhere you go. On the street, in the home, on the job, all alone. Highways, byways, highways, byways. You got to make Disciples daily, children, everywhere you go. You got to make disciples daily, children, everywhere you go. You got to make disciples daily, children, everywhere you go. On the street, in the home, on the job, all alone. Highways, byways. Highways, byways, you got to love the brothers daily, children, everywhere you go. You got to love the brothers daily, children, everywhere you go. You got to love the brothers daily, children, everywhere you go. On the street, in the home, on the job. All alone, highways, byways, highways, byways. You gotta love 
the sisters, they lead children everywhere you go. You gotta love the sisters, they lead children everywhere you go. You gotta love the sisters, they lead children everywhere you go. On the street, in the home, on the job, all alone. Highways, byways, highways, byways, high highways, byways, highways, byways, byways. Love you guys. You are dismissed. Oh, Mike. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Thank you, Robert. <laughs> Go ahead, Mike. Please be. Thank you, Robert. I didn't give my name first. I'm Mike Davis. And uh, I am the vice president of the church board. I'm speaking now for our president. Do a speaker and add something to do. Um, I want you to remember these two scriptures. Just think about them a lot the rest of this month. Well, not just the rest of this month, but all the time, but especially for the rest of this month. Ephesians 4.29 says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. The second scripture is 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 through 13. It says, now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to respect those who work hard among you, who are over you in the Lord and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard and love. It says, hold them in the highest regard excuse me, in the highest regard and love because of their work. As a body of believers, we as members of the Memphis Church, our thoughts, our ideas, our feelings, and opinions are all important. Despite how you view yourself. No matter where you are, no matter what role you play. God looks at you as he looks at you and me, one of his children. With that being the case, we will be, you will be given the opportunity to have an input in providing our lead couple, the Wormers, with feedback to them um, as they lead our congregation. As you probably know from your opinion, growth in your job comes from you listening to your boss. I don't know about y'all, but that's what it's always been for me. Today you'll be given a form, if you choose, to complete and return by the 17th of this month, two weeks from today. The form is for those of you that do not have computers or are not computer literate. <laughs> Believe me, there are people that still like that because I work with some of them. Uh, for those that would like to have the form emailed to you, you will receive it from Tom, our executive director of, what did you say? Communications. Communications. Okay. It will be sent today. Uh, by Tom, those that receive the email version, it will come to you in Google form. So you can input your information just by typing it in. You don't have to print it, complete it, and return it. You don't have to do that. Go on your computer and do that. After your response is received on the 17th, the deadline is when? March 17th, two more weeks, that's right. The leadership team will summarize them, meet with the Wormers, and they all will review them together. You'll be given the opportunity at the bottom of the page to give your name. That's your choice. If you choose to do that, it could open up a, uh, 
a good amount of feedback. So um, if you choose to not do that, that's fine. It's, this is anonymous. So it's between you and God what you put. Uh, but if you put your name, it gives, you, it gives the Wormers an avenue to follow up to see how things are going after that. So now that I muddied that water, any questions? <laughs> Oh, good question. See me after service if you want a hard copy. But I, I encourage you, only a hard copy if you don't want to do it online. Because, yeah, you're going to get an email. Yeah, I see, I see that. Well, you, yeah, that's true. My wife's vehicle is a computer. This part of the annual review. I'm sorry, I didn't state that. But this is like we all have annual reviews at work and stuff. And so that's what this is. And, and like I said, it's really to build up, not to tear down. Okay? Because imagine how you would feel if on your annual review, if your boss tore you down for no reason or tore you down. Uh, any questions? Any more questions? All right. Thank you. Very different.